Good evening. Welcome to the Glasoff Gang. Tonight, Islam's assault on women's sexuality, and for this episode, viewer discretion is advised. Our guest this evening, backed by popular demand, Dr. Mark Christian, the President and Executive Director of the Global Faith Institute. He is the son and nephew of high-ranking leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in his home country of Egypt, a former Islamic Imam who converted from Islam to Christianity. He dedicated his life and work to the proposition that, quote, the first victims of Islam are the Muslims themselves. Dr. Christian, a real privilege to have you back on the Glasoff Gang. Thank you very much for having me, and no more uh, than women are the victims of Islam. You know, women in Islam are the most victims of Islam. Absolutely, and that's why I wanted to have another program uh, to follow up on our very recent program on uh, Islamic female genital mutilation, uh, which so many viewers appreciated, Dr. Christian, because you're a doctor from Egypt uh, that actually, you know, performed surgeries trying to fix and heal many of the Muslim girls who were victimized by this terrible Islamic crime. And I want to expand on Islam's war on, on its women in, 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 in this context. But before we do, briefly sum up for the viewers that might have missed that program what your experience was and how you tried to heal these Muslim girls. I think we discussed in details in, in, in the previous episode uh, the, the assertions about uh, if uh, female genital mutilation uh, has Islamic teachings and backup uh, or not. And, and we definitely find that uh, through those five uh, well-documented and well uh, put together hadith by the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. We went back into history of how that started. And yes, it started before Islam, but definitely Muhammad threw his weight onto this and uh, encourage it to be done uh, on a regular basis uh, throughout the Islamic world. And it doesn't matter which country it is, it is all backed up by the Hadith and by the teachings of Muhammad. Also, we talked about my role as a physician, as an OBGYN back in Egypt and in other places in the Middle East, and how I was on a regular basis trying to fix the atrocities and the severe harm that has been caused to those women and girls uh, uh, throughout their life and how it's affected their sexuality and their personal life and personal hygiene throughout their life and how I was on a regular basis trying to fix those problems. Thank you, Dr. Christian, and we're so grateful for your testimony on these issues. And not only were you a doctor, you were also an imam. You are a former Islamic imam and you taught on these issues as well. And when I say issues, I mean the issues of women's sexuality and Islam's control of, sex, of women's sexuality and also assault against women's sexuality because that's what female genital mutilation is, but that's only one ingredient. So my question is, tell us a bit about how, as a Muslim imam, you regurgitated and taught this theology um, in terms of women's sexuality and what Islam's teaching is on it? Uh, in a way, uh, to be honest with you, Jamie, and, and this is a well-known fact in the whole Islamic world, that Islam teachings and Sharia law and fatwas in the Imam circles, which is the, uh, very similar or equal to a pastor in Christianity, uh, that they are obsessed by the lower part of women and the relationship between the woman and her husband and i'm talking about the the, the intimate relationship and talking about you know uh, passing gas and, and and other things that it seems ridiculous from every perspective but this is the majority of the fatwas or the talking that is going on in the islamic circles all the time now dr christian and also again uh, female uh, excuse me uh, viewer discretion is advised. But when we talk about female sexuality, Dr. Christian, for instance, you just bring up, um, I don't mean to be silly here, uh, but these are actually serious issues because Islam is controlling every ingredient of human life, but especially women's behavior and the ingredients of their, of their sex lives. But you just mentioned, for instance, passing gas. Oh, explain that to us. There's actual Islamic Imams who, who make rulings on this? Are you kidding me? You know, the, the, throughout Sharia law and, um, you know, and, and throughout the teachings of Islam, it talks about 
passing gas and how uh, men and women has to control this and are they are allowed to pray or touch the, the the Quran after they pass gas or not and what they need to do it and how uh, and how they can uh, uh, clean up themselves after passing gas and, and and the prayers and so forth it is it is an important part in Islam uh, that talks about that issues so just like dr. Christian I'm actually you know I, this is so what if a per what if a female accidentally passes gas during an inappropriate time what what happens it doesn't matter about the female actually as a matter of fact okay. regarding that issue it's male and female okay they're not supposed to touch the the quran the holy book they have to clean up um, after that and and they cannot go to prayers without uh, doing the the ritual washings uh, again after passing gas and there is actually some teachings about passing gas while swimming uh, during Ramadan and how that uh, can break their iftar and they have to, uh, you know, do the, you know, fast the day again and, and get money out uh, for doing that kind of a big sin, which is passing gas underwater during their fasting. So, Dr. Christian, this is a natural process in the human body in terms of what we're talking about. How does this work then if this is something that each person does several times throughout the day what 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 how do you explain this in terms of islam's position on this and in in many respects it's kind of a punishment and oppression of the human being is it not it, it, you know it's considered uh, you know uh, similar to going to the bathroom and for the person to be a good slave to God when he prays or touches his holy book, the Quran, they have to be in a certain uh, status of cleanness. And this is why they have to perform some, uh, you know, ritual cleaning before touching the Quran or praying. Yes, it is a natural thing, but it is dealt with uh, the same way that you are going to the restroom or going to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, any kind of personal hygiene situations. And, you know, uh, that brings me to a point that I was uh, watching uh, a, 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 um, an interview uh, on TV in the mainstream media TV in Egypt that was airing throughout the Middle East. And we are talking about a group of the top leaders of Al-Azhar University discussing the very things that we are just talking about. And I find it ironic while the world is facing huge big problems and facing a whole bunch of things and, and very uh, uh, pressing matters, and this is what the top leaders of Islam are talking about. And one of the things that brought up into this, one of the imams, who kind of uh, an imam uh, causing so much trouble and problems lately, and he is uh, questioning Islam and questioning the teachings of one of the biggest imams in Islam, uh, Sahih Bukhari, I don't know if you know him or not. And he's questioning the legitimacy of this, and he brought a very important thing. It is allowed in Islam, in you know, throughout the teachings of Islam and uh, teachings coming from Al Azhar University, that somebody can clean up and uh, after going to the bathroom and use the Bible and the Torah and the Injil, which is the the Old Testament and the New Testament, as papers to clean up themselves. And he was asking, why would the why would Islam teaches that? And the biggest two imams, and I'm, I will put the link to that interview on your uh, on your website after we hear this and they said you know this is allowed because it is not a legitimate uh, islamic or uh, or uh, uh, scripture right now so actually islam teaches that yes you can use uh, the bible old testament and new testament to as a toilet paper and this is a discussion that's going on in the mainstream media uh, in the arab world why we are facing the problems that we are facing. And as a matter of fact, one of the imams that is causing so much trouble, he's asking, why are we dealing with those subjects and ignoring ISIS and ignoring the terrorist that is going on in Egypt and in the whole uh, Middle East? Well, thank you, Dr. Christian. And we may have, on one hand, got sidetracked there for a minute, but on the other hand, not at all, because the overall subject here and our theme is Islam's invasion of every ingredient of human life and its attempt to control every ingredient of human life and so I want to now transfer over to the assault on women and the ingredients 
of their sexuality. As an imam, give us an example of some of the things you were teaching and some of the things in Islamic theology that we could see as the attempt to control and oppress women. There is different hadith and different, different teachings in Islam that deals with the woman as a property for the man. As a, as a matter of fact, when the woman signed her marriage contract, for example, this is the end of, uh, you know, uh, her, her free will, uh, as to say. She does not have a saying of whether, uh, you know, she can have an intimate relationship with her husband or not. He can call her anytime. There is no that concept of rape between husband and, and wife in, in Islam whatsoever. Because when she signed the contract, and this is what Hadith says, if she signed the contract for marriage, then she is obliged to uh, give herself to her husband anytime. On the other side, her husband is not her own property. So she cannot do that with him at any time as, as she will, because he, she has to ask his permission and she has to get his own approval before intimate relationship. But while on the other side, he has the right to her body at any time, anywhere. There is a hadith, as a matter of fact, that is, uh, you know, I, I think it is it's very demeaning. And it says that the woman has to give herself to the man, even if he ask her, uh, uh, ask her body on the back of a, a donkey. And this is exactly the translation of the hadith. By itself, it's demeaning to the woman. She cannot even ask for anything, even treat it as a human being. He, he wants her, he can get her. The Quran says, your women are your soil. You get to your soil whenever you want to, except during menstruation. Because in Islam, during the menstruation, during that time of the, of the month, the woman is unclean. She should leave the, 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 you know, the, the, the presence of her husband. She has to be living on her uh, own and ousted from her life until she gets clean and she has to wash again in a certain way. So just a second, Dr. Christian, so in a marriage in Islam, if the husband, whenever he would like to engage in sex, there is never a time where the woman in the Islamic marriage is entitled to say no, correct? Nothing, ever. Uh, the teachings in that is very clear. I can mention you multiple examples. Okay. Now, and also, if a wife would like to have sex with her husband, she can't just, how we could say, uh, let's say, approach her husband. Uh, she has to ask permission, and then he approaches her. There is a hadith about, from Muhammad himself, the prophet of Islam, who says, the woman cannot take advantage of her husband and use him while he's sleeping. She has to walk him up to take his permission if she is want to have an intimate relationship with him. So Dr. Christian, also if menstruation starts for a woman, she needs to leave the house immediately if her husband is in the house? No, uh, it depends on the culture. She doesn't leave the house, but she leaves the presence of her husband. So she goes in a different room, treated as unclean. She cannot practice any of the, of the Islamic uh, rituals whatsoever. And her, and, she, and her husband should not touch her whatsoever during her menstruation. In some areas, he can if he really wants to be close to her. But uh, it is discouraged in Islam to read to, to touch the woman while she's unclean. And it's very clear in the Quran about that. Dr. Christian, where is the left in the West? Where are the leftist feminists? Where are all the human rights organizations protesting this, demonstrating against it? I mean, if we're for women's rights, if our culture and society is for women's emancipation and equality, etc., why is this not discussed on CNN, on MSNBC? Where are all the feminist organizations? Where is the left? Well, this is a very good question that I will leave the left to answer this on all, all those people who are advocating for the right of women. But I'm going to tell you what I do myself as a Christian and a, new, and, and a born again Christian. I use the story of Jesus been walking and uh, the woman who has been bleeding for quite some time touching him and he turned around and he said that you are safe and you are not less of a human being to show what Christianity and not the left and the feminist. This is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus he is the, our role model of human equality between men and women and all human beings alike. 
And I use that story when I'm reaching out to the uh, women in Islam and tell them about Jesus that they know as a prophet, but I'm telling them he is way more than a prophet and giving him them an example of how he treated women. And I always boost their ego a little bit and tell them that they are not less as a, of a human being just because they are menstruating. Your menstruation is a sign of life, a sign of fertility. It is something that they should be honored and should be a, a, a sign of life. And they should not feel like they are less of a human being or unclean as Islam teaches. Why? Because Jesus said so. And we have that story, an example of how Christianity treated women and boosted up the woman uh, up to an equality to the man. Well, Dr. Christian, thank you very much. And look, I've studied Islam throughout my life. And I found, as many uh, people, of course, have, that there is a death wish uh, on, in, 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 on many realms in Islam, and it manifests itself in martyrdom and suicide uh, bombings and in jihad, etc., etc. But one could find it even in what we're discussing, that if there is a demonization and a dehumanization of, of a woman while she's menstruating, in many respects, this is a hatred of life itself because this is a sacred time because menstruation represents birth and life. And so even in that context, already Islam is anti-life. Is there legitimacy to that criticism? 100 percent. I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, um, women are treated less of a human being in Islam just because it's menstruating. And it says very clear in the Quran that because they menstruate uh, or they because they have this time in, in the month where they cannot practice their rituals as Muslims, they are less of a Muslims, and this is why they call them, uh, they are less of a human being, and they are incomplete in their mind and their humanity. And this is just because they are menstruating. Dr. Christian, while you were an, an imam and you were teaching these things, what was your conscience saying to you at that time? Um, that's a good question, and, and, and it tells you a lot about the mentality when you are a Muslim. You kind of put your mind on the side, and you don't deal with things other by obedience. And I was an obedient Muslim uh, who is very devout and tried to uh, pass the teachings of Islam to the other fellow Muslims who were asking me questions. And, and, and my conscience was kind of, you know, asleep while I'm dealing with those issues because uh, you know, you grow up with Islam and you're under the bondage of Islam and you're under the, the chains that is holding your uh, right thinking as, as a Muslim. And you cannot even deal with this things with logic. And I was dealing with it was one thing that, you know, most of the Muslims or all Muslims are dealing with. When Allah says so, then Allah knows more. And all what I, my job is to be an obedient slave and submissive to Allah and do what, what he says I'm supposed to do. And the only way I know the will of Allah is through Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, because he does not speak for himself, like the Quran says, but he speaks the words that God put in his mind and his heart, and uh, through uh, Allah speaking to him, or Allah uh, sending his messenger, Gibril, to him to tell him that those things. So I kind of put my, my whole mind and conscience on, on hold, you know, and just being obedient and a good slave to God. Dr. Christian, our time is up just under a minute. What is the conclusion? What is Islam's view of women and why does it treat women in the way that it does? The first victims of Islam and the most victims of Islam are the Muslims themselves. And there is no more than the women uh, as victims of Islam. If you look at the women in Islam and how they are treated as a less of a human being, controlled every aspect of their life, and when they sign their marriage contract, they're signing a contract for submission and obedience to their master, that like Islam says, if I ask anybody to bow down to any human being, I would ask the woman to bow down to her husband. There is no love, there is no respect, there is nothing whatsoever other than obedience. And women in Islam are the most oppressed human being on earth. And the control that Islam has on her life, treating her as a sex object when, when she's seven and eight years old, uh, demanding to put hijab so she can cover her hair, and to be treated as a sex object from the get-go, this is atrocity. 
and this is needs to be exposed and need to be learned about and we should not abide with those things in this century that we live in. Dr. Christian, thank you for being such a noble and courageous truth teller in our time and uh, it is an honor and a privilege to have you on the Glazov Gang and thank you for standing up for Muslims and for Muslim women and for all people that suffer under Sharia, Islamic law and Jihad. Thank you very much for everything that you do and we wish you the best. Thank you very much and thank you for having me and I think the only hope in the world is in Jesus Christ and we will continue to proclaim his message to the world and to the Muslims on a daily basis. I have to say amen to you on that one, Dr. Christian, and we'll see you next week on the Glazoff Gang. Good night. Thank you.